As the sun becomes a red giant, every planet will react in its own way. I've talked about three of them on this channel already, the far future of Saturn and the far future of Mars respectively, and Earth one billion years in the future. Saturn could eventually tip on its side as Titan migrates away from it, and Mars has a slim but non-zero chance of becoming habitable once more, before melting into a lava planet as the sun continues expanding. The solar system and all its planets will eventually die if the sun is not prevented from becoming a red giant, and talk about how to do that in preventing the death of the solar system. But each of the planets will have a very different future as this happens. And the far future of Neptune is just as unique as all the rest. Welcome to the ninth episode of my Halcyonic System series, where I go over the systems of dead or dying stars. This episode will be about Neptune, and what's in store for it as the solar system ages. I'll eventually make an episode like this for every solar system planet, but for now I've already made ones for Earth, Mars, and Saturn. For most solar system planets, they all have one thing in common. They're going to get very, very hot. Mercury, Venus, and potentially Earth and the Moon are going to get swallowed by the red giant Sun. Mars and the asteroid belt will be reduced to balls of lava. Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus will probably reach temperatures in the hundreds of degrees. But possibly not Neptune. Neptune is the furthest planet from the Sun, about 30 AU, or 30 times the distance Earth is from the Sun away. When the Sun becomes a red giant and expands to over 250 times its original size, Neptune will get significantly hotter. But maybe not uninhabitably hot, like the rest of the planets. There's a chance that Neptune not only becomes the last planet with habitable temperatures, but might not ever actually get much hotter than that. But there's a few things to get to first, most notably the destruction of Triton. Neptune's largest moon Triton was previously a dwarf planet that was pulled into Neptune's orbit and made into a moon. It orbits in the opposite direction Neptune rotates, which is something most moons that formed alongside their planets don't do. Its orbit is also inclined, instead of along Neptune's equator. Again, moons that form alongside their planets usually have their orbits close to their planet's equators. Both of these facts combined very strongly suggest that Triton didn't form with Neptune, and was instead captured by it. Because of this, Triton is slowly spiraling in toward Neptune, and in about 3.6 billion years, it'll be destroyed, creating our solar system's next major ring system. There are other rings that will form over the next few billion years. Phobos will face a similar fate to Triton in about 50 million years. However, the ring system Phobos forms will be extremely small and faint, like the one around Jupiter today. Other ring systems will also fade away, like Saturn's, which will probably be entirely gone within the next few hundred million years. For a few billion years, there won't be a planet in the solar system with a major ring system, until the destruction of Triton. In fact, Neptune's future rings could potentially be even more impressive than Saturn's. Chrysalis, the hypothetical moon that was destroyed to produce Saturn's rings, may have been around the size of the current Saturnian moon Iapetus. And up to 90% of that material never became rings at all, as it was swallowed by Saturn. Triton, by comparison, is about 10 times more massive than Iapetus, meaning Neptune's ring could very well be bigger than Saturn's are now. This will also mean that, barring something unforeseen like a rogue object getting captured by Neptune, which is unimaginably unlikely, Neptune will become the only giant planet with no major moons, unless you count Proteus. It'll have the usual dozens of small asteroid moons like every other gas giant, but none big enough to become round under their own gravity. Which is a shame, because Triton is one of the most interesting moons of the solar system. It has an atmosphere dense enough to form clouds and haze, has active cryovolcanoes, and almost certainly has a subsurface ocean, and just has a very unique history. But it won't be around forever. Unfortunately, Triton will be long gone before the sun becomes a full red giant, meaning it won't have the chance to warm up and melt, which would have made for a very interesting environment. Luckily, the exact same thing will also happen to every single object past Ceres, so it's not like we're going to be out of evaporating outer solar system objects. The same will also happen to Neptune's minor moons. They're made mostly of ices, and so as the sun slowly heats up, they will as well. Eventually, the colder volatiles will begin to boil off, turning them into basically comets. But before that, Neptune will stay cold. Unlike most solar system objects, Neptune isn't going to start really feeling the effects of the red giant sun until very late. It'll warm up a lot, but its temperature will probably only rise above zero degrees in over 7.5 billion years from now, right at the very end of the red giant phase. This means that of all the solar system planets, Neptune will be the least affected by the end of the solar system. Its rings will come and go, as the remnants of Triton will eventually fade away just like Saturn's are today. But it will always remain decently cold. Don't get me wrong, its environment will drastically change. The difference between negative 360 degrees Fahrenheit and, say, 80 is a lot. 
Neptune's current clouds are made from methane and ammonia, which need very cold temperatures to form. Eventually, these clouds won't be able to form, and water clouds will take their place. It probably won't be blue either, or if it is, it won't be the same color of blue, and not for the same reason it is now. Its weather patterns will also drastically change. It currently has the fastest wind speeds of any planet in the solar system, and that'll probably only get more extreme as the sun heats up and adds more energy to its atmosphere. The sun will likely expand to around 256 times its current size. At the same time, it'll get somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 times brighter than it is right now. It'll also lose a significant amount of mass, pushing all the surviving planets backwards, as its gravity is no longer strong enough to keep them in the same orbits. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and the Moon probably won't survive, as I've already explained, and all the remaining planets will be scorched beyond recognition. Even Uranus could heat up to hundreds of degrees. The Sun's habitable zone, where the temperatures are right for liquid water to exist, will move out. First to Mars, then to the asteroid belt, then to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and finally, right at the end of its life, Neptune and the Kuiper belt. But there's a chance that Neptune's temperature will never rise above the boiling point of water. Unlike all the rest of the solar system, which will end in scorching temperatures, Neptune could watch the end of the solar system from the habitable zone. If you've seen my video about temperate ice giants, you'll know that ice giants in the habitable zone are one of my personal favorite types of planet. In 7.6 billion years, Neptune could very well become one. Of course, this isn't entirely confirmed. There's been very little research done to how planets other than Earth will be affected by the red giant sun. The 256 times bigger number is only an estimate based on stars similar to the Sun, and even minor differences will cause big changes in temperature. Exactly how hot Neptune will get is really anyone's guess, but its maximum temperature may end up being somewhere below the boiling point of water. That also doesn't necessarily mean it has habitable temperatures. 200 degrees Fahrenheit is below the boiling point of water, but you wouldn't consider that very habitable. Also, Neptune is going to be migrating away from the Sun during this time, which will cool it down. And there's also a large amount of uncertainty with how bright the sun will get, and I've seen numbers as low as 730 times its current brightness to as high as 3000. There is a large amount of uncertainty as to how hot Neptune and all the other planets will actually get. However, from what I can tell, it does remain a possibility that Neptune spends the last phases of the sun's life with temperatures still below the boiling point of water. But that depends on how bright the sun gets and how much mass it loses, as that determines how far away Neptune moves. So, don't treat Neptune having Earth-like temperatures at the end of the solar system as an established fact, because it very much isn't. It's a speculative possibility on my end, because unfortunately there just hasn't been much research done into this. Stellar evolution is fairly hard to model, and it's likely we won't know the definitive far future of Neptune for a while. However, even if it doesn't end the red giant phase with habitable-ish temperatures, it's much more likely that it will have a phase of having Earth-like temperatures eventually. The question is really just when. Anyways, I like temperate ice giants so much because of how Earth-like and simultaneously alien they are. Ice giants can have surface gravities similar to Earth, and atmospheric pressures as well. Temperate ice giants also have Earth-like temperatures, meaning you could float around on them with nothing but a breathing mask, no spacesuit needed, assuming you were at the right altitude. They could also very well have rain made of water, and water clouds, and a weather system at least somewhat resembling Earth's. If it weren't for the fact these planets have no solid surface at all and are several times the size of rocky planets, they would seem pretty habitable. The idea that there are planets similar to Earth, yet with environments totally inconceivable on this planet, with atmospheres thousands and thousands of miles deep that eventually pressurize to such an extent they become oceans, is extremely interesting, and why temperate ice giants are some of the best types of planets we've ever found, at least according to me. Neptune can spend its last days around a star that isn't a white dwarf like this a warm ice giant surrounded by dozens of evaporating comet moons. Speaking of which, Neptune's moons won't handle this change nearly as gracefully as Neptune itself will. They'll likely become comets, ejecting all their volatiles into space until only the small amounts of rocky material they have left remain. Though the Triton rings will be long gone by the time Neptune is in the habitable zone, a new cloud of cometary material could form around Neptune. Which honestly is probably the most interesting way to spend your last days around a living sun. All the other planets will just be hot balls of death, but Neptune could have fairly normal temperatures and be surrounded by comet moons. Which, at least in my opinion, makes Neptune's story one of the most interesting of all the planets. Yes, Saturn will eventually lose Titan and flip on its side, Mars has the very small chance of becoming habitable, and the last remnants of life will cling to polar seas as the moon drifts away from Earth. But Neptune will not die because of the red giant sun. It won't begin evaporating or get its atmosphere lost to space. 
it won't reach temperatures hot enough to vaporize most metals, or if we get lucky, even hot enough to boil water. Neptune will just slowly get warmer right up until the end. But all good things have to come to an end. Neptune will only spend a few million years with habitable temperatures at the absolute max. Because again, all this is happening at the very end of the red giant phase, just under 8 billion years from now. For the vast majority of those 8 billion years, Neptune will remain fairly cold, and it's only in the last few hundred million where things get really interesting. Except for the destruction of Triton, of course, which will happen much earlier. But this will only be a short blip of heat in Neptune's long history. Because as soon as the red giant phase ends, it'll become cold again, and the heat won't come back. Once the sun's red giant phase finally ends and it becomes a small white dwarf, Neptune's days as a temperate ice giant will be over very quickly, no matter how hot it actually gets. At this point, the white dwarf sun will be about half its current mass, meaning Neptune's orbit will expand by a lot. The sun will also be at this point far less than even 1% of its current brightness. All in all, Neptune is about to get extremely cold. As in, so cold it might as well be a rogue planet, because the white dwarf sun just isn't going to be hot enough to give it any sort of light whatsoever. Even Earth and the Moon, if they're still around at this point, will receive less light than a full moon gives Earth today. If that's how dark it'll be at somewhere around 1.5 AU, you can imagine how dark it'll be at over 30 times further away. Neptune will quickly return to its natural state, very, very cold. This time, just a few degrees above absolute zero. After that, billions and billions of years will pass with nothing happening on Neptune. The orbits of its moons will change, maybe a few of them will become rings or get ejected, but those events will be very few and far between, if they happen at all. But what we can be certain about is that Neptune will eventually be ejected from the solar system. While we don't know when or what will cause it, Neptune being ejected is just a numbers game. Eventually, after billions of years, some star will pass close enough to yank Neptune out of orbit. Because it's the furthest planet from the Sun, the Sun's gravity will be at its weakest. Meaning, of all the planets, Neptune is the easiest to be pulled away from the Sun. At some point, it's just going to get unlucky. Stars move around the galaxy. It's an inevitability that one will get close enough to eject planets eventually, and Neptune, being the weakest bound planet to the solar system, will probably be the first to go. So, Neptune will almost certainly be the first planet to leave the solar system after the Sun becomes a white dwarf. After that, it will wander the Milky Way as a rogue planet for the rest of eternity which won't really change all that much at this point, because it's already extremely cold anyway. Eventually, the rest of the planets will also be ejected. Again, it's just a numbers game. Whether it takes a few million years or a few trillion, it will eventually happen. Neptune is just most likely going to be the first. All in all, Neptune's death is one of the most unique in the whole solar system. It'll eventually get a ring system that could be bigger than Saturn's. It might be the only planet that doesn't ever get unbearably hot. It could even have habitable temperatures for a short while. But then, long after the sun has died, it'll likely be the first planet to leave the solar system forever, ejected into deep space. Of course, we can prevent all this from happening, as I talk about in preventing the death of the solar system. But assuming we do nothing, this is how Neptune's story ends. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, check out my other videos about space and space colonization.